The Israelites had been away from Egypt for a month and a half. Amazing things had happened during this time. They saw God miraculously destroy Pharaoh and his army, and they crossed the sea on dry ground because God had parted the waters for them. Now they continued their journey through the wilderness toward the promised land. Still, Israel will struggle with physical and emotional obstacles, uncertainty, fear, hunger, thirst, frustration, and regret. Last week, we explored the ways God protects and fights for his people. This week, we will explore the way God provides for his people when they obediently follow him. God can and does provide for our needs. He wants his children to trust him in, both, in faith, both in times of plenty and need, remembering that he is always near. So let's pray, and then uh, Cynthia is going to read for us today, because Ellen is not here. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you because of the sunshine and because of the beauty of this earth. We thank you because you have brought us together here where we can study your word. We ask that you would help us to uh, gain some knowledge from this lesson that we can apply it to our lives and that we can learn to trust you and be obedient to you, knowing that you provide for us in every way. We thank you for your love and for your salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Cynthia is going to read. Um, I add, there's the scripture in the book is verse Exodus 16, 1 through 18, but I added a couple of verses. <laughs> Sounds familiar. All right. <clears throat> Exodus 16, 1 through 18. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin which is between Elam and Pink Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses said, also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them. At twilight, you will eat meat, and in the morning, your land will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, little flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? <laughs> For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did what they were told. Some gathered much, some little. But when they measured it by omer, those who had gathered did not have too much, and those who had gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Exodus 16, 31. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Thank you. All right, so it's been one and a half months since the Israelites left Egypt and they are on the move again. And 
I, I guess I recreated what Patty can do last week, but these are over here. This is the Sinai Peninsula. They're in the Sinai Peninsula. They were near Elam, which is there, and they were headed into the wilderness of Sin. Um, it's not to be confused. There's also a thing called the wilderness of Zin that's up here, closer to Israel, across from Edom. Um, and the, the term sin, I, I question why where they came up with that name make, makes you wonder. What, Sinai. Yeah, it's because of Sinai. It's the Sinai Peninsula and Mount Sinai down in there. So um, here Israel begins to question their situation and even express regret in leaving Egypt. What were the Israelites grumbling about? Hunger. Hunger. Were there were there complaints towards Moses and Aaron, reasonable or unreasonable? Were their complaints reasonable or unreasonable? Yeah, you're hungry. Um, you know, they probably had a certain amount of food that they brought with them when they left. And they were probably running out of food and beginning to question it. So um, how exactly did this legitimate need for food color their view of their past? What were they starting to think about their past? It was glorious. <laughs> Do you really think that if they were as slaves that they would have had all the meat they wanted to eat? The good old no. days. Yeah. You think of the good old days, even if they weren't so good. Yeah, yeah. So, so it really their their physical need was coloring their view of of what their past was, and so um, they had all but forgotten uh, the abuse and the oppression that they suffered while they were in Egypt. The certainty of food and provision and security of slavery was more appealing than the insecurity of freedom. The need for food, water, and shelter are legitimate concerns, but we must be careful that our focus is not um, our focus on meeting our physical needs is doesn't cloud our spiritual perspective. Clearly, they would rather have um, they thought they would starve to death in the desert, and they said, "Where would they rather have died?" In Egypt. In Egypt. Notice that they. They did not acknowledge God's hand in their deliverance from Egypt. They blamed Moses for bringing them to the desert. And keep in mind, they had they had um, clearly know should know that God's presence was with them. They had that pillar of cloud, and that turned to a pillar of fire. Yeah, at night it turned into that. And so the, his presence was there. He had delivered them. He had already provided for them in many ways. And yet they were grumbling and they were all had all but forgotten that it was God who had delivered them. Um, my Wearsby commentary, I wanted to read something that I found that was in this particular section of the commentary. And it said, in our pilgrim journey through life, we live on promises and not explanations. When we hurt, it's a normal response to ask why but that is the wrong approach to take. When we ask God that question, we're assuming a superior posture and giving the impression that we're in charge and God is accountable to us. God is sovereign and doesn't have to explain anything to us unless he wants to. Asking why also assumes that if God did explain his plans and purposes to us, we'd understand everything perfectly and feel better. Explanations don't heal broken hearts, but promises do, because promises depend on faith, and faith puts us in contact with the grace of God. Commentary goes on to say, when circumstances are difficult, we're prone to pray, Lord, how can I get out of this, when we ought to be praying, Lord, what can I get out of this? Mm -hmm. It isn't important that we get our way, but it is important that God accomplishes his purposes and receives all the glory. God permits trials so that he can build godly character into his children and make us more like Jesus. Godliness isn't the automatic result of reading books and attending meetings. It also involves bearing burdens, fighting battles, and feeling pain. So in light of what God had already done, what requests do you think the Israelites could or should have made to Moses? How should, what they, might they have gone to him and asked? 
had two comments. <clears throat> Even if they ask the same thing, it's the way they ask about it. They may have said, I'm hungry, or we're really starving. You know, can the great Lord that just uh, less than 60 days ago parted the Red Sea, can he provide us with some food? And, and so that's the first thing. They, it's not what they asked in this case. It's mm -hmm. how they asked and how they contrasted right. the being enslaved. But the other thing that is so striking to me, and it's very human, this is why we have to write down our testimonies or the things the Lord has done for us. Mm -hmm. How quickly they, I mean, it's six, we're not even 60 days out. And they've already forgotten that the red, the red sea has parted before them and the whole Egyptian army has been killed. It's impressive how quickly as humans we can forget. I'm not saying them, I'm saying us. Mm -hmm. Right. The things that the Lord has done. But when you're hungry, <laughs> things change. Yeah. And, and that's exactly right. They they could have mm -hmm. approached Moses in a much more positive way, saying, we know that God has already provided for us. He's already done all these things for us, but can he do it a little bit more? Can we make sure that we're going to have enough to eat while we're getting our, making our way through this wilderness place? So um, once again, God patiently responds to the complaints that he hears. And what does the Lord say he will do to solve the problem? At the beginning of verse four, what does he say he will do? Rain down bread from heaven. Rain down bread from heaven. That sounds pretty graphic, doesn't it? <laughs> bread. Did they need this test, though? I mean, the promise to rain down bread could have occurred without them complaining, prior to their complaining. It would be nice if Moses didn't have to go back and say, but the people are complaining. It would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what instructions uh, does... God give regarding this provision and what reason does he give for issuing these specific instructions? What are they supposed to do? Pull out each day. Uh-huh. And gather enough for that day. For, for, day. for that day. Mm -hmm. Um why and well does it go does it say anything here about the sixth day or is that not yeah, yeah. 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 So what do they do on the sixth day? Yeah, they're twice as much. Okay. You know, it's it's interesting that they, they don't yet have the Ten Commandments, and yet God's already making, you know, mm -hmm. he's setting up the provision for what's going to happen when he expects people to rest on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So um, why does God want to test them? He they will follow his instructions. Okay. All right. What do you think? Pardon? Okay. Perhaps the point of the test was for his people, for his people is to see what they would do when given a choice. Um, in Egypt, they had no opportunity to make choices. And yet as a free people, they would need to learn to make choices and to live with the consequences of the choices that they made. So they had to learn that as well. Why would God choose to provide food in the manner that he did? <clears throat> and how are the people being formed through this process, do you think? I think for me, verse 17 and 18 are just fascinating. So some of them gathered more and some of them gathered less. But when they measured it out, it still was what they were supposed to get. That shows the sovereignty to me of God acting in this as well. So... Even though they, they did go out and they gathered like they were supposed to, the Lord was still like, I'm still going to write the ship according to the standard that I have set. And I, I just think that's amazing. I don't think I've ever noticed that in the word before. Right. So God was making provision for them and making sure they had exactly what, what they needed. Said. What they needed. Um Deuteronomy 8, 2, and 3 reflects on the gift and the test. It says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that humanity does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. 
When Jesus, uh, question number six, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he did so saying, give us today our daily bread from Matthew 6, 11. Why do you think this prayer was important for what Jesus wanted to instill in his followers? Emphasis on daily. <laughs> I'm, I asked Leslie if she would read something from John 6, 48 through 51. That says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet you died. Here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for all the life. <clears throat> of the world. Okay, thank you. So Jesus is saying here. I mean, in the in the Lord's prayer, he was he's he's talking about bread, you know, daily bread, in the sense that physically we need bread daily, but we also need spiritual bread daily. So we need to remember that that's why that God wants us to approach Him and to be with Him on a daily basis. We need that daily renewal. Of, of understanding and the relationship and knowing God's love and experiencing that relationship with him. Um, so it wasn't, it was our need for spiritual nourishment as well as physical. Mary Lynn, could it have anything to do also with uh, what stockpiling might do to our faith? Mm -hmm. um, at a congregate one time in a particular place, and she had a um, closet full of toilet paper because when she was a kid, it was scarce. And so she stockpiles it now. Um, I, I think of uh, people eating comfort food uh, and, and, and so on and so forth when it comes a little bit more closer to what you're talking about here. And I'm kind of wondering if, if, if um, Christ wants us to be a little bit more uh, prepared to move from this place to the next, symbolically speaking, than he would be with us fortifying our nest eggs. That, is that the right word? Uh, fortifying our uh, long term stability. I wonder if he would want us to be a little bit more nomadic in our pilgrimage. I'm speaking metaphorically. Right, course, right. Uh, no, I agree. But I, it does have something to do, perhaps, with laying your treasures in earthly uh, things. I agree. I, th I think that's an excellent point. <laughs> and like you said, to move on, you know, if you've got all that stuff you got to lug with you, and it makes it a little bit harder, you know, just you think that you're doing yourself a favor because you're stockpiling stuff, but in the end, it's it's going to weigh you down. I spent the last two years getting rid of stuff that has been in boxes for 30 years, so I've taken <laughs> one place to another. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. 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 So that's a fresh metaphor. That's, that's a fresh question. Right. That's, I'm, I, I have been in that phase myself where I keep, I'm nagging my family to get rid of stuff because it's just like, it just clutters everything. You know, yeah. it clutters up your life and it's something you worry about. It's something you agonize or do I, so but you're right that that is a good point so not only the day so the dailiness of it is that god will provide he provides for us and we don't need to stockpile at all just for security because god should be our security and not depend on god yeah exactly question number seven we're going to be done with this pretty quick. Um, what do Moses and Aaron say that lets us know this feeding event is more about satisfying their hunger? In other words, in the evening, what will happen? Well, they'll leave their camp. Right. But which is interesting. They have to go out into the fields surrounding the camp to pick up the manna. But God provided the quail Right in it's a cute little bird. <laughs> <laughs> to come into the camp. Okay. And in verse six, how what how does he say? What does he say? In the evening you will know what? 
You, you will know that it was the Lord that brought them out of Egypt. And in the morning, they will see what? The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. So the Lord has heard the people. He'll, they'll know that they heard. Um, what is the significance of Moses redirecting the people toward God? Several times, twice he says, who are we? Who are we? You know, they're grumbling at Moses. Mm -hmm. So do, do, do you think that if you grumble a lot about what you have, you'll get to see the glory of the Lord? <laughs> I think it says right there he did it because they were grumbling. He had heard it. Well, I don't know. Do you think you grumble also a lot the ground and swallow it? Yes, you know, once in a while you see a a phrase and you think, I've read that how many times and it never stood out to me. And that stood out to me this morning. Mm -hmm. That you will know the Lord if you look the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Does it fit anywhere into the scope that you have not to grant that? Could be. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I'm sitting in the missionary's chair today. I didn't know like <laughs> it's also when you come up with them. Where they are in their faith, right? So you know, I, I have had experiences where I've seen the Lord be, I'm not going to say he's not responsive, but more responsive to people who are younger in their faith. It's to kind of like the way they say that when you're dealing with a baby, when the baby cries, yeah. you know, you go and you deal with the baby so the baby understands that somebody is here and someone is going to take care of it. That's human, right? If you don't attend to a baby's need, then the baby will start to not cry when they have the needs and they'll think they're not, they're all alone. Like failure nobody, to thrive. And they become failure to thrive. Yeah. And so again, I go back to the fact that this is 60, less than 60 days out. The, the 15th day on the second month. So for what, 45 days out. And they are just, I mean, just imagine you were saved 45 days ago. Your whole understanding of the Lord is totally different than most of us in this room. And if you have a, a complaint or a grumble or whatever, and you're like, well, Lord, you didn't help me get my hangnail better. And then all of a sudden somebody says, hey, I can help you with this hangnail. You're going to be like, wow, he's real. <laughs> and he's proving himself again and again. But as you get older in the faith, then the Lord expects a little more out of you. Yeah. Like, you should know that I am here. Because as we go into um, Exodus and further, I'm thinking about what you said, Carol. I, I said, he opens up the ground and swallows them with grumbling, complaining, and disobedience. But that's not 30, 45 days out. That's, you know, a little further out. And he expects more of them in terms of trusting him. Right. So I think that some of that kind of... Um, responding without all of the other things we know the Lord is capable of doing, none of which are pleasant, um, is indicative of the fact that they're still young in their understanding of who he is. Right, because we seem to forget that they spent 400 years in Egypt and, and they started out knowing who God was, but right. whether or not that carried down through the generations. I mean, you're talking multiple, multiple years. generations right. that didn't really know the Lord. Right. That's why Moses was afraid to approach them in the first place, because they're going to say, well, they're going to ask, who is this Lord? Yeah. You know, and, and the Lord said, reintroduce me. Yeah. This is who I am. Yeah. It's also instructive that none of them are going into the promised land. That generation that came out, no, the younger ones might, but they're going to die in the wilderness. Even Moses is going to go into the right. promised land. So that although they don't know that yet, they don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that's true. Um, so so they 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 are in the learning process. They're very new, and yet I I, I guess it, it what bottles my mind is the fact that that pillar of cloud is sitting there right in front of them, and they right. knew that that's what led them out. And it's like God's presence was was uh, in a physical way was available to them all the time and yet they still manage to forget so so we who don't have that pillar of cloud in front of us every day you know we're we're still inclined to forget that god is leading us or should be were, leading us. even if you were to assume that we had a pillar of cloud we might behave the same way too well yeah. true true yeah
Although, you know, I, it just, it, it boggles my mind because I think I'd be afraid of that cloud. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. I think though you'd be afraid of that cloud because you know in hindsight what it is, what it was that you provided it. Ooh. I think the, the, the scenario goes back to the fact that they were so young in their faith. Um, I, I The word education jumped into this several sentences ago where God is educating these folks as to who he is. You want it? Ask for it. You don't have to. Don't. We, we got our three-year-old granddaughter. And she doesn't say, could I have some more chocolate milk, please? Oh, more chocolate milk! You know, okay. <laughs> right. So Nana gets up again, and I say, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, a lot of these examples kind of equate to the week we just had with my darling dear granddaughter, Julia, who I love very much, and I'm going to miss when I drop her off this afternoon. But uh, it was just like, oh. <laughs> God bless my daughter. Please pray for her every day. <laughs> and the guy she married. Mm -hmm. so, so Moses clearly saw that the people's dissatisfaction was really, should it be aimed at God and not at Moses or his brother. The question, who are we, was his acknowledgement that everything that they had done so far was by God's direction. Uh, God had done it through them. In themselves, they were powerless. So their authority came from being chosen by God to lead his people, and the Lord was the one who was in command. So in verses 9 and 10, Moses tells Aaron to tell the entire community to come before the Lord, for he had heard their grumbling. And while Aaron was speaking to them, they all looked out to the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in that cloud. In verses 11 and 12, the Lord speaks to Moses. God heard the grumbling of the Israelites and tells Moses they will eat meat at twilight and in the morning they will be filled with bread. And at the end of verse 12, what does it say? And they will know what? That I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord their God. Yeah, you know, Moses didn't get in trouble this time for speaking ahead of the Lord because he said in verse 8, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat. Eat, and they, they have never been promised meat yet. That's true. But just, actually, I mean, it, I don't know whether it's controversial or not, and I had, didn't really double check. I had notes in my Bible that um, I don't know if there's some conflict. Where did I have that? I had a note somewhere that said that actually the meat didn't appear until year two. Mm -hmm. I don't know where. I had a note for that, and now I can't find it. But it, I had a note for that, and but it says here that he, he, they clearly had meat, and this was only in the first month and a half, so they had the meat. It's okay to be vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> Are you speaking? What he said to the people when they eat meat at night. Now that they're going, what? Have you had meat? Have you had meat? I haven't had any meat. Because he hadn't done it yet, he does it that night. Oh. Yeah, actually, um, I had it in Numbers ten eleven. It says that they got quail in the second year. Mm. So maybe they meant second month. I don't know. Maybe that was a misspeak. Mm -hmm. So they um, they were given quail was the kind of meat. How did the how did the bread appear? It appeared in meat. Yeah, so it was dew, but it says it was when the dew was gone, there were thin flakes on the uh, of frost, like frost on the ground, appeared on the desert floor. Actually, I didn't know the desert floor had dew, but apparently it did. So. You know, it, like in late fall, when the weather is turning colder, if you look out, you'll often see what was the do when there was a little bit of frost on top of the grass? <laughs> so um, maybe they were used to that kind of thing now and then. Because the desert gets really cold at night. Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's there because it's dry. Yeah. So it had, so anyway, but the dew appeared, and then when the dew was gone, there were these flake things on the ground. And they had to go gather it. Not that there were some that were up early getting the best of it. They thought, 
And yet there were some who liked to see him in the morning. Yeah. Well, actually, my, one of my commentaries made the comment that, that it kind of forced the people to get up and, and have to gather their food because they said that um, it, it would actually be gone after a certain time of day, you know, yeah, or something, you know, yeah, so they had to, they had to, they had to make an effort, so they had to make an effort, I mean, like you said, the quail just basically plopped in and dropped on them, you know, but the, they, they did have to go out and gather this. So Moses had told them to gather enough for each day, um, an omer uh, for each person in the household, which was about two quarts per person. Um, and that they did not have, whoever, when they gathered it, they didn't have too much. They didn't have a, too little. They had exactly the amount that they needed. And then what does verse 31 say about this bread? People of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Right. Given what manna means, what is it? Yeah. It's interesting that they called it as opposed to they asked the question, what is it? What is the it? Scripture says, um, right. Um, right. What manna other... means, what is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have a name for it. Right. So that's so why they. Give it. We'll get... What is it? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yes. That's. Um, my commentary had said that it comes from two Hebrew words meaning what that. What, what that? that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, a couple different places in the Psalms describes manna as the food of angels and the bread from heaven. This food was obviously not like, like natural bread of the desert. It was bread from heaven itself. And it was white like coriander and tasted like wafers made from honey so it was probably sweet um why was it important that they did as they were told in in terms of how they gathered it how much they gathered no, um, again there i i like what what don said they're being taught the lord is again as you know right out <clears throat> and he's trying to teach them how to trust him and so it's important to to do what you're told, I guess, especially with the Lord, so that you can learn to trust him. And I know we didn't read it, but in verses, um, in verse 20, yep. it says, notwithstanding, gonna... they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. <laughs> and so it's like, there's some who, they still got the over they were supposed to get because the Lord adjusted that. But those who said, okay, I'm just going to eat a little bit just in case. And so it's interesting, again, you said, as you said earlier in the lesson, Mary, when did they ever have enough to eat? So as people who had been enslaved, they were probably very much used to taking what little rations they got and then parsing it out over several days, more than maybe what it was supposed to last. And so the Lord is saying, we got to we gotta squeeze Egypt out of you. So you come out of Egypt, now we got to get all that Egyptian mentality, that slave slave the sin for us today mentality out of you. Yeah. And yet they could collect it on the sixth day and collect twice as much. Yeah, that's the Lord. <laughs> yeah. He's amazing, right? The right. Lord is amazing. Is that not a miracle of it some is a sort? Miracle. So yeah. And yet it was certainly the God God was providing for them. Um so verse 20 said that those who let's, you know, who paid no attention to the order found the portion they kept overnight was full of maggots and began to smell. Um, and then it to answer what Carol was saying, um, 21 does say each morning everyone gathered as much as needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. So it was gone after a certain time. So they had to get up, they had to make sure they were up and, and able to do that. So this was certainly a test. It was a test and an educational experience all at the, all at the same time. Have you found that your relationship with God has grown more in times of need or plenty? And why do you think that is? Does anyone have an experience with that? Well, you, re you rely on him more when you're in need. When yeah. you're in plenty, you'll figure out, I got this. Yeah. 
it's it's easy to think you don't need the Lord when you've got a lot. We we have a kid who had some money and didn't need us. And now he has a dollar something in his account. He needs us. Now he needs you. <laughs> Um, I, I um, being a bookkeeper and liking numbers and that, I always took care of the money in our home. And um, two things. Once I said to Eric, well, you need, because he likes to spend and charge. And I said, well, then you take care of him. Well, it took me months to get back. So it was two months he did it, and it got his spiritual gift. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I took care of the money. And when he was dying of cancer, and my mind was everywhere except on our needs, you know, monetarily. And God really, it, it was amazing. I, I'd go in and talk to Bush when he was stuck in the bedroom and say, I just paid the bills, and Bush, we have so much left to over. God's math is so different than my math, than our math. And in times of need, he takes care of it. I mean, if Butch hadn't brought in any money for a long time, because he, he worked here at the floor three days a week. That, well, that bought him his toys. And so he was paralyzed and didn't have any of the toys. So that may, may have helped. But um, God really took care of us. And and, and I learned from that. And I I used to worry about money and money. You didn't have enough to do this or that. And I no longer worry, not since then. Um, God really proved himself to me. That he was capable of taking care of us better than I ever could. Mm -hmm. And he, he continues that to this day. I, I have to not be fooling. You know, I have to uh, still keep the, the lid on some expenses. But... I have everything I want and everything I need and a lot of my wants. And uh, God does it all. He takes care of me. Mm -hmm. I, I have I get Social Security and, and some of his retirement. And and I, I've pretty much blown through my retirement from the Army. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I really wanted them to say, you're going to get this much a month. And they gave me the whole shot. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've, I've been blessed by being able to help others along the way. And, um, and it, but it doesn't bother me that I have very little of what I earn left. God takes care of me no matter what. No matter <laughs> what the situation is. No matter when the gas prices go up or the utility prices go up. God takes care of me. Uh, oh, excuse me. I'm not sure I'm hearing everything here, but <laughs> my wife grew up uh, in a home where within 150 feet of her house were uh, birds something like quail. They were chickens, called chickens. And uh, <laughs> Joyce's job was to collect eggs every day before she went to school and it was the living it, it provided the living for her where she started to complain about chickens and eggs and all that stuff and for 85 years she's been complaining about chickens <laughs> she marries one <laughs> <laughs> I can hit it for you. <laughs> judge, you're going to be judge. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. <laughs> when I was in grad school, um, the Lord really used that time in my life to teach me about money. Because, you know, students are poor, and I was very poor, so I did not want to depend on my parents during that time. So I had my own situation, very, very poor. Um, but that is where the Lord taught me that money is something that he sends in, and then he, he kind of tells you what you're to do with it, and then you are to let it go. I don't hold on to money, <clears throat> and I don't let what I have or don't have dictate how I'm going to see my own life. And the one of the examples that sticks with me is one time I was sitting in service, 
and they ended up taking up the offering. And I really didn't have anything left. You know, it was like I had to wait about two more, about a week to before my um, stipend would come in. And the Lord was like, okay, go ahead, you know, empty the wallet, put it in there. <laughs> I didn't want to do it. I was like, that's not you, Lord. That must be some other voice I'm hearing. But in the end, I took, I think I had like 20 bucks. I took the $20, I put it in the offering. I was not happy, but I did it because I felt like it was the Lord. When I came home, I looked in my mailbox and I had forgotten to get my mail. I opened up my mailbox and there was a letter with a personal check from a friend of mine from undergrad. He had sent me $50. <laughs> And that stuck with me because the Lord is telling me to empty the little 20 I have that I think needs to last me the next week. And waiting for me when I got home, I didn't even know it, was $50 that a friend of mine who I hadn't talked to in a couple of months, he just happened to send me this money. And so... It's many situations like that. You know, I, I just don't let money control me. It's easy to give because I know the Lord will always provide. And I, I pastor in Pittsburgh who used to say, the Lord will give you the things that money will buy without giving you the money. <laughs> so I don't need the cash to get the food. Lord? Where's that envelope? Right. <laughs> uh, man, I didn't want to put this in. I got to. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I just learned. I, I, I thought there was too much for Sunday school. <laughs> you got me. You got me. It's not me. It's the Lord. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> they're they're going to open up that envelope and go, what's this? Right, right, what's going on? Manna. Right? Yeah, manna. manna. <laughs> Would you say that your understanding of what you need has changed from earlier times in your life? If so, how? Would you say your understanding of what you need has changed from earlier times in your life? I mean, not only, I mean, our new, our needs do change, but how much do we understand of what our needs change? Last week, excuse my voice, as we grow in our fellowship with the Lord, you, you, our needs change from day to day to day, from year to year. Mm -hmm. I think that I noticed that in my own personal life. Right. Well, a lot of times, too, our perception of our needs, you know, the oh, understanding. Yeah. A lot of, oh, I need that cell phone. Oh, I need to get my nails done. Oh, I need this. I need that. Yeah. But a lot of times, you, as you grow, and especially in your relationship with the Lord, your understanding of what you truly need changes. And I think my awareness of how deeply and desperately I need the Lord has grown as I've grown in my faith. I now know and have known for many years, I can live with I can live without everything. I remember telling people in the Bible study I went to, you know, I love my family, I love my children, I love all of that. But the only thing I actually need right now is the Lord. I would be sad to see everything go, but I can never be without the Lord. That is the most important thing to me in my life. There's a song, it's not Salvation Army, that says, you can have all this world that gives me Jesus. Mm -hmm. Pop into my head. Uh, and all the world that gives me Jesus. Then don't we also sing, He's All I Need? He's All I Need. Yeah. We sing that, and yet, do we really live it? That's... Yes, and I think the word that you use is growing. Mm -hmm. That's the most imperative word. When we look at this, coming out of 400 years of slavery, can we imagine what that must have meant where every day there's a certain occasion within your your system that you understand that the next day is going to be the same as the prior day and so forth and so on. Then all of a sudden you're put out in the mm -hmm. and, and to 
to recognize that the Lord spread the, the river so you can get through it. You know, that, you know that's happened before. But to grow in faith, that was Christ was trying to our expression. God was trying to help the Israelites to understand. I have a situation I think you never know about. A man had been in prison for 49 years. Never killed anybody. Never intended to kill anybody. Unfortunately, got caught up with his brothers in a terrible situation. He kept his faith from the moment he moved in. Hmm. All those 49 years. He talked to me every Friday. His wife talked to me every Thursday. And both of them had a faith that one day he would be out. And he has come out, and he has to learn now what it is like to be out. And so he has to grow in his faith, too, realizing he's now a free man. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he's, he, it's inspirational, and I think we can learn from those kind of individuals that have been in a terrible situation, but have come out of it and yet held their heads up high and praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. Metaphorically, oh, what? Is he still in the hospital? No, he's out now. Good. And he's going to be at our uh, Bible study next Thursday. He intends to be there. He intends to be there this past Thursday, but he was taken back to the hospital again. But he he intends. He said, we both want to be there. Because this Salvation Army Church through its Bible study has given him and he and his wife so much help. That is an amazing testimony yeah. from that man. Amazing. Well, metaphorically, we were all slaves to the sin that once encompassed us. Mm -hmm. And so as we break away and we have that freedom, but we still, again, I mean, we had choices before that we made that made us slaves to that sin. Now we have choices that we have to make as well. But our choices have to be, we have to be more in tune to our relationship with the Lord in order for our choices to be pleasing to the Lord, to keep in relationship with the Lord and making sure that we know that he is the Lord. That was the whole point. That's a lot of what this lesson stressed was that he, the Lord was trying to educate the people, you know, who had not really known him on who he is and what he can do. And he wasn't like the Egyptian gods. He wasn't something that was man-made like the Egyptian gods. So he was something very different. He did have, again, he rep had a physical presence in the cloud, but that wasn't, the cloud was not God. Mm -hmm. So we, and again, we, I guess we have to make sure we look at that as well, that we know we're focusing on God mm -hmm. and not some representation of him. Mm -hmm. So... I love what John said about his granddaughter. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. You know, it's like the Lord will use these situations to remind us of how we can be, right, towards him. So here she is, more time with milk. And that is exactly what the, the Israelites are. And we can be like that mature, immature in the way we act. And he's imposing a standard, please. And she's like, ah. <laughs> but we are exactly like that, you know? And so it reminded me when he said that the Lord used to use my dog. I used to have this dog named Cuts. And um, one time I had to run into a building and I left Cuts in the car. And so I'm walking towards the car, just walking my normal pace. And Cuts, she was a Yorkie. She's in the back of the window. <laughs> I mean, just like going crazy. And I looked at Cuts and I thought, that's not going to make me walk any faster. And the Lord said, that's how you look to me. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, oh, oh. So the little girl, it's like, it's again, it's a reminder when we're dealing with people who are younger in their faith. They're going to mature. And they're going to stop, you know, get in the car. You know, we're all going to mature. And I stopped barking okay. at the Lord like, I like, that's not going to make me move any faster. <laughs> so. Mary Lou, could I take two minutes just to sure. kind of challenge the thought I'm, I'm getting? Okay. Uh, I've heard, uh, what, 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 the part of this is about freedom, correct? Yes. And um, there is a, a very high price to pay for freedom. We 
some of us, more, some of you more than others, understand more about that cost than I do. But um, when when we, when we talk about God and, and God alone, I, I get that, and, and I think we can put that we can, we can put that on the shelf as certified, validated, and, and, and so forth. But when we leave out the horizontal aspect of our relationship toward others, uh, for instance, it was touched on briefly about the people who, the 80-20 rule, who probably picked up a little bit more and the people who picked up because a lot of people were picking up a little bit less. Well, when we leave out the horizontal relationship, which in my mind, the cross exemplifies, I, I think that freedom is in danger. And, and I think that in our present age, it's in danger. Uh, I, I I look at, um, and of course, everything by the time that gets to me in my lonely den is highly tainted. Um, but when I when I look at the, the the laws that are being passed in Illinois, when I look at the leniency that's being granted toward looters in L.A., Chicago, and New York, when I when I look at the so-called compassion extenuated to people who are creating heinous acts against fellow human beings. Um, I, I think it's it's time for us to wake up a little bit more and understand that the symbol of the cross not only represents our relationship with God, but it does really represent our relationship with others. Who is my neighbor? Um, and who has God put in under my sphere of influence? Uh, and who who am I supposed to care for with my affluence? Um, I I get uncomfortable when we talk about reporting to God and God alone because we got uh, the last words from Christ that I see were go and and bring others into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm concerned about. The, I'm concerned about where we are as a nation right now, you know, uh, where we are as a, a globe, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with Putin spouting off the things he's spouting off, and with Pritzker putting in these laws of so-called compassion, and, and with, you know, the I, I said it all, and I don't want to repeat it for a third time, but I'm concerned about our relationship for between us, even in some of the discussions that are going on amongst us. Yeah. That we say we, we try to regain some sort of unity, try to get on some sort of a and, and for those of you who are 65 and greater, I mean you 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 know what the world was like after World War II when we invited everybody home and we sang the same songs and wore the same clothes and and, and, and celebrated as, as Americans. Um, whether it be right or wrong, we had an agreement and we went forward as a nation. And I'm I'm concerned about what I see now in the cost of freedom. I'm sorry I took too much time. No. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that comment because that's that's why I do struggle. I I understand what you're saying. You know, when you say God is all we need, you know, and that you love your family and everything else. But truly, most of us would really we would fail to thrive. I think if we didn't have. Yeah, but that's not what I'm saying. Um, yeah. So let me make sure that I clarify. I'm not saying that I don't want. Well, right. I'm not saying that I don't care. What I'm saying is, where Jesus would say, who is your mother and who is your father? Those who do my will. What I'm saying is that my relationship with the Lord is more important to me than anything else. That's fair. That's fair. Amen. So that, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> not, right. not that... You know, okay, get rid of Addington tomorrow. No, nope, don't get rid of Addington. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, right. it's, it's, so I want to be clear. That That's what I'm saying. My loyalty to Christ, I have just learned that's me. That's, this is what I need to live. Right. So everything else is important, and my other relationships with other humans are very important to me. And I... I hope I walk that out. I guess my my issue has to do with the terminology need, yeah. because I still think that we need other people as well. Yeah. Think about it more like oxygen. I need oxygen. I don't need Addington, but I need oxygen. So think about what the word, the way I'm using yeah. the word need as 
necessary to continue to live? Well, I think need is on the table because we need that relationship with Christ in order for our relationship horizontally to be healthy and to be in accord with his word. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and we need a new relationship with Christ in order for everything else to function the way God wants us to. Right. Well, it, I don't know. And I think it's getting harder and harder, like you said, oh. even within the church. I think, you know, the global church, I think it's harder and harder that so many people are adapting liberal oh, ways of thinking and ways of, of, you know, just assuming that, you know, under the guise of diversity or inclusion or whatever terminology they want to use. And we have to be careful because we can't. I think more and more the younger generation is being influenced by things that are not good. I keep reminding us that the Bible tells us this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Matthew right. Matthew 25, 20, It's going right. to happen. Right. I, I'm often re reminded of what I learned growing up. Um, there are people that I love who don't follow the Lord in the way that I think they should. And of course, you know, I'm perfect. <laughs> Wrong. I am not. I'm far from perfect, but I have my own beliefs that have stood me in good stead all my life. But people that I love today have made decisions that are very contrary to that. But the thing I learned and I still work at is loving the sinner hating the sin and I if I were to if God told me to face these people with with what I think is true and honest and I had scripture to back it up and everything which is one of the reasons I'm so scared because I think well I scripture just and and I I can't remember where things are found I'll say in the Bible somewhere it says and, um, but if God asks me to talk to people and tell them what I believe, I have found out, he's asked me to do that a couple of times recently, and they actually agree with me that that's the way it should be, but not right at this moment. <laughs> And so, you know, I, I, I just say, okay, I have to be as patient mm -hmm. with them as God is patient with me. And and so I continue to love them and encourage them and uh, pray for them and try not to be judgmental. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's it's one thing if you're dealing, too, with people who profess to be Christians, and then it's a whole nother thing like what you were saying about the the looters and all the people you know and the, the how this society has has really drastically changed i i keep saying i i say to bob all the time what makes them think they have the right to just go in and take stuff out of stores and stuff like that you know but we have to remember that they have a whole different mindset they don't they don't really think they need to answer to and, god you know so. and perhaps some people need to go to jail to, to find god because God is working in the jail, and uh, so are so are other forces. But but people have come to the Lord through circumstances, right? And and so I continue to pray for them that they would know that there is a God and that He will supply their needs. They don't have to steal to get what they think they need. Maybe, maybe in the very short term, some some of those looters do need what they're stealing to provide bread for their family. But there's other ways of going about yeah. that too. <laughs> well, but some sometimes you have to be careful with that, though. There are different not, opportunities. Opportunity does it, and, and and those are a very real thing. A lot, of, a lot of people that we think, well, well, they should, you know, McDonald's is hiring. McDonald's doesn't want them either. 
You know, I'm telling you, you know, we make judgments. We're very judgmental people often. And God has really, really worked on me to leave it to him. Mm -hmm. To not be judgmental. Okay. Do we have any other closing comments or we go? We're over time. We thought we were yeah. gonna get Yeah, I know. I thought we were gonna get <laughs> Not this way. <laughs> okay. All right, let's pray as we close. Father, we thank you for this discussion today. We thank you because you've um, maybe opened our eyes to some uh, situations or to an understanding. And in the end, what it boils down to is that we need you and that we need you alone. We ask that you would be with us as we depart from this place and that we could take with us this lesson and that we could, um, through our example and through our words, that we could let others know that they need you as well. We just ask that you would bless us, that you would bless those around us, that you would help us to continue to be mindful of our sphere of influence where we can uh, impact other people around us. And we just ask that you would be with us as we go. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.